So I'm excited to share with you what I think is the next huge technological innovation that's going to impact all of us. And it builds on some innovations from the past. So there was the desktop 40 years ago, there was the, then the laptop, and then 10 years ago, the mobile. And I think what's next is going to be augmented reality. And it's going to impact all of us in, in, in some really interesting ways. Now, what augmented reality is not, it is not virtual reality. This is a really unfortunate photo. Um, <laughs> so for those of you who haven't gotten the memo of what augmented reality is, first, let me say virtual reality is where you have a screen up into your face and you don't see the world. Who knows what's going on uh, in that toaster that's strapped to that guy's head. Um, and augmented reality is sort of like the, the stepchild to uh, virtual reality. But what I want to talk about today is why I think it is so exciting, so interesting, and uh, these are, this is going to be a great uh, uh, next wave. So augmented reality has been around. The military uh, in, has invested a ton in creating these helmets where you can fly flighter, fighter planes or helicopters where you look out at the physical world and you get digital information on it that can kind of inform you on how to fly safely. Or on the plane that I flew here to get uh, to Newark, the uh, Boeing plane had this clear screen that the pilot looked through and got information. Um, also, augmented reality is here. And I bet you there's some kids that don't realize if you go to an actual football game, the yellow line isn't there. <laughs> so, um, and you want accuracy to see if Tom Brady has gotten you know, uh, first down against the Colts. Uh, you're also going to want accuracy in this photo. Say someone's doing surgery on your brain or the brain of a loved one. And I show this, this picture, and I made it a little smaller than the others so it doesn't gross people out, but that's a real brain. Imagine if a surgeon has the tools to augment what they're looking at to better understand where to do a procedure. Imagine if the radiologist who takes the image of the brain in three dimensions and you have a hologram to look at, and instead of porting it to a two-dimensional screen and having the nurse and uh, the, the patient and the loved ones all look at a two-dimensional screen, they all see a hologram in 3D. Think of where the opportunities are uh, for safety, for innovation, uh, for saving lives. So augmented reality is about looking out in the world. And when you look out in the world, you have a camera taking in information. And that bring in, brings in something very interesting called uh, computer vision or machine learning. So here are two images. Um, the one on the left, there's a sign. It's in a language. Maybe you don't read it. And you don't listen to it, and something bad happens. Because if you translate it, it says road collapsed. And that can mean anything. But that could be bad if you're driving a car. But machine learning can translate information so you could be up to speed. And the next Olympics in Tokyo, all the signs are going to be enabled that people can translate them into whatever language they may speak. The other image is of a dinosaur. Many of us have been to museums where we see you know, a dinosaur before us. And often those bones are just collecting dust. And every few months, every few years, I feel like I hear another theory. Did the dinosaurs have feathers? You know, did they drag their tail or not? And imagine if you could put up a screen and, and see information about the latest theory. Or you could go to a museum and feel like you're actually in the Jurassic Park movie because you can interact with uh, the dinosaur. I think that's the future of learning. That's the future of exploring and creativity. So my wife tells me I am not a good dishwasher guy because I leave too much food on the plates. And I'm embarrassed to say that we've had four technicians over the years come and fix our dishwasher. And as our devices around us get more and more complicated, they're harder to fix. You need to be Leonardo da Vinci to kind of figure out the mess that I've created in my dishwasher. And I think the future of repair, the future of maintenance, even the future of manufacturing is going to be someone using augmented reality to help walk them through step by step what to do, help walk them through looking at what they're seeing and tell them, don't cut the red wire, that would be bad, or um, help them call a friend. So instead of looking down at another screen where there's like a, a 6,000 page PDF that you got to sift for something, you can visually see what to do. And it, this has implications for other things. And my dishwasher could be a turbine that you know, is instrumental to the power of, of, of Asbury Park. The other thing we can do with augmented reality is we can create a hyper-reality, 
a heightened reality. We can design things without actually building it, but we can then experience them. We could build a building, and you could show uh, the client it, and you could become like Ant-Man, be micro and go inside it, or be macro like the jolly green giant and experience it. And think of doing this with life sciences, all, all sorts of other things. So here's an iPad, and you could imagine just you know, swiping through and seeing different types of furniture you might want to buy. But imagine if you could take that iPad and look at your room. And this is Wayfair, and this is a service you can do today. They have 7 million pieces of furniture, and you could adjust to where you want this couch and see how it looks. And say you want to have it have polka dots. I personally believe polka dots are coming back. You may not, but I do. And say I call my friends. I say, hey, let's talk about this. And here are my friends. And, and, and Leia beams in. So instead of looking at a two-dimensional screen in a Skype or Google Hangout, which is really impersonal, you can actually render people and think about collaboration, think about uh, decision making, and think about whether my polka dots would survive on that couch. Uh, and that was 40 years ago that in Star Wars they kind of said, you know, this is coming. So there's a guy named Gordon Moore who, who put out there that every 18 months you can double the amount of transistors that can um, uh, uh, be on a chip. And that's, that's held pretty consistent and that's allowed for a lot of breakthroughs. I think there's some other breakthroughs too that are happening that are going to make augmented reality really interesting. One is control. How do we interact with technology? Right now, we're sort of held hostage by how quickly we can type, which is crazy when we could take 10 to the 8 bits per second of information through our eye, and yet the bandwidth that we can connect with computers is often defined by typing. There's all these other things happening to the point where soon it'll be thought and uh, emotion that computers can contextually read in us. So instead of us explicitly telling a computer, do this, do that, the computers are going to understand um, where we want, what we want. Another trend that's very interesting is content. We're no longer just taking two-dimensional images. We could scan this whole room and recreate it and interact with it. And for AR, that has a lot of implications. And then finally, connectivity. Um, the internet in this pi first picture, it was only in four places. Last time I checked the architecture of the internet, it's all over the place. And in, with 3G telephone service, it would take 24 hours to download what you can now download in three seconds when 5G rolls out in the next year or so. So there are people who are imagining, with all these converging factors, what could augmented reality do? And Barmack, who is one of my colleagues at the Media Lab, drew up these uh, images and said, I think this is where things are going. But I also want to point out some of the challenges. I was at Google I.O. five years ago this month where uh, some Googlers were on a blimp and they jumped out of the blimp wearing a product that Google spent a billion designing. It was Google Glass. And this is augmented reality. You can look through it and see information on the world. And these Googlers successfully landed and everyone gave high fives. So I taught a class with my colleagues. It was the first class on the planet on making apps for Google Glass. The students were nonplussed by the end of the semester. It turned out that the Google Glass was very isolating. And I think one of the exciting things about AR is it can connect people. Now, these are my two kids. I took them to a museum recently, and they gave everyone an iPod. The, the museum had a big endowment. And I noticed my kids did not look at the art at all. They just looked down at the iPad. And how many parents here are just wrestling with your kids about screen time? I mean, I'm sure that's in the dictionary by now, and if not, it will be by the end of the year. And another interesting fact is that millennials, and my kids are the next generation, I don't know what we're calling them yet, but millennials are statistically going to take 27,500 selfies of themselves. Okay? That's 52 hours a year they're spending taking selfies. So what does that tell you about how they see the world and how they see themselves? They see them at the center of a red dot, and they want to document. And so while Google Glass was isolating, and to some extent this is isolating, you're not really interacting, there is some hope. This summer, a land speed record was set. In 43 days, there were 500 downloads of this particular software. It was the fastest to get to 500 million downloads in the history of the planet, and that was Pokemon Go. <laughs> And what I think is interesting about Pokemon Go, and some of you, you know, may, be, may be leaders in it, is that it gets you to look out into the world. So these are all the companies, as of last week, that are investing in uh, augmented reality. And they're investing in different aspects of it. And this tells me that there's a lot of attention here. And people are predicting this market is a $100 billion market in five years. 
And the big ones are getting in. Facebook just announced they're all in. Disney said, we want you to come to our theme parks and not only see digital information on our parks, but we want you to take things home that we can add dimensions to. And Apple, I think there's a lot of pressure on them this fall, they're gonna announce the new iPhone. I think Pokemon Go is gonna be in maps. And what you don't realize, and this may feel kind of freaky, is that the watch and these new earbuds are actually augmented reality enabled right now. So these are the companies that got in the last waves, and now it's shaking up who are the companies in this next wave. Now, let me go to the very beginning of augmented reality. It was started by this guy named Ivan Sutherland, and I was on the phone with him the other day. He's kind of a uh, cranky guy, and he said, John, I don't want credit for inventing augmented reality. He created this device, he called it the Swords of Damocles, he's 78. When he created it years ago, he said it was called that because if it fell on you, it would kill you. Now, he said, I invented that because I wanted to see this cube in front of me. I wanted to render a three-dimensional cube, and he did it. And then a few years later, that led to a team at Utah creating this teapot, which this is foundational to the company we know as Pixar and animation. And so as we embark on this next wave using technology, we should start thinking about what we want to do with it. What problems do we solve? want to solve? What, do we, what opportunities are there that this can address? And here's my son. Uh, my oldest, and uh, when I handed him the Meta headset that my team has built, we, we've raised $100 million to build it. He immediately knew how to use it, and our passion, kind of like Ivan saying, pick a passion, was to create zero learning curve. We want people to put this on and be totally immersed and see holograms, be able to move them with their hands, and be able to start playing with it. So David Senge at the Media Lab said to me, John, as humans, we're not very good at connecting biology and technology. And he went on to explain that when he went back to his country of Sierra Leone, he would see his countrymen without their limbs because they lost them in the Civil War. And he said he was struck that none of them were wearing the prosthetics that they could get. And he realized they weren't comfortable. They didn't mold to the soft and, and hard part of the, of the nub. And he said, I'm going to make prosthetics that work, that connect biology and technology. And this, this image has nothing to do with AR. But it does say that as we go into this next wave, instead of us conforming to technology, the two dimensions of the mouse, the two dimensions of the GUI. We're three-dimensional beings. We should start thinking about how we can get technology to adjust to us. In terms of neuroscience, how do we like to think spatially? In terms of using audio and machine learning to analyze our eyes and our heartbeat, what are things we can do? And I think the future of holding hostage to a rectangle that has control over us is over. And um, while virtual reality is big, I think augmented reality is going to be five times bigger. And what it's going to take is all of us thinking about how not to just ride this wave, but make this the biggest wave of uh, making humanity reach its potential. And that's our identity, looking out into the future. Thank you very much.